Hello everyone, Nick here, and today I am going to do a little bit of a mixing tutorial. Now, I'm not an expert on mixing, but this last track that I did came out pretty well, and I used a few new techniques, and I thought maybe I'd share them. Maybe it'll help someone out there. Um, so if any point throughout this video uh, the mouse jumps around, it's just because I had to stop recording and uh, probably change the, uh, the video thing. Anyway... So let's get started with this for today. So right from the start, you can see there is a fair amount of tracks here. I'm using Reaper, by the way. That's my favorite DAW. And uh, basically, I'm going to go through each of them and show you what effects I put on them and what I did and where I mixed them in terms of how I did the whole thing. So anyway, let's get started. So right from the start, I'm going to expand this. And you're going to see a lot of these blue tracks throughout the thing and what the blue tracks are is just my way of color coding where this is an echo track and uh i'll explain more about what that means later it kind of has to do with recreating the sound of a studio and i'll explain more about that in a second but uh let's just get started with the drums so over the years i've done drums a lot of different ways i usually always use tune track easy drummer and this time was no exception i did the same thing um, what you're seeing here is an exported WAV file from a different Reaper document. So anyway, this is the drum track. However, in the past, I usually either mix all the individual parts of the drum separately or I bounce them. Um, so this time I did it the same way. I did them all separately. And that's pretty much the first step. I usually start out with pretty much, let's see here. I start out with the kick drum and I'll get a basic level for that, you know. So you can hear that. So that's there. So yeah, and essentially on the kick drum, I've got a few new plugins that I use. Um, I've been using this Red 37 plugin, which really, I didn't really do that much. I just used the EQ. Here, I'll make this a little, uh, can I make the UI bigger? Let's see here, 150. And uh, basically, yeah, that's that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm just raising a little bit of the EQ boost. The reason why I'm doing these is because I'm experimenting with new plugins. Um, this Waves, I guess, is a company that makes Abbey Road plugins. And I, if I'm being completely honest, like, you know, Waves, since I bought the plugins, I haven't really had the greatest experience with them as a company. Um, they, they, like, seem to spam my email constantly and... I've heard a lot of weird stuff. Like, I guess when they upgrade the software, like, it doesn't actually upgrade it for you. Like, you have to pay if they come out with a new version, which sounds insane because I've got plugins I've been using for 10 years, and the same license that I bought back then still works now. So, I don't know. In, in a year, if Waves say I owe them a bunch of money if I want to keep using this, I might not be using them. But all that said, right, these plugins actually sound really good, which is why I like them. And essentially, they're all stuff that the Beatles would have had in the 60s. So this Red 37 one is like a, it's the console that they would have used to track in. I usually just use it as a really mild EQ boost. Um, this one is a compressor. And again, I just use a very mild compression on this track. You can hear, if I play the drums, you'll hear what it sounds like without. So let's get rid of this, these two. It's a little bit softer, not as much character compression adds just a little bit of punch and then I put this little J37 thing this would have been the tape machine that the Beatles would have printed on and it, it basically gives a little bit of a tape saturation effect it's really really subtle you have to use a bunch of them to really even hear it so I, I, I basically put it on all the tracks that I'm, that I'm tracking in so yeah there's that now what I'll do after that I might as well talk about the echo track now this is sort of something that is probably technically wrong but one of the cool things that the uh, the waves plugins have is this thing called the abbey road echo chambers and so what i will essentially do is I'll, I'll show you here i'll take a track like this and then i'll i probably don't have it saved oh there you go i'll go to the the echo chambers right and uh normally what i would do is i use these settings now called EMI 1962. Now, I just want to give credit where credit is due. I actually did not come up with these settings. There's another guy on YouTube named Clay Blair. I think his studio is called Boulevard, Boulevard Recording. And uh, he's obviously done a lot of work with this kind of stuff. And he had a cool video where I think he did a cover of um, From Me to You. 
and he kind of studied if you guys know that song there's a lot of like really thick echo on on that beatles track and so he essentially used this plugin to sort of recreate that sound and more or less what it is it's the, a lot of these high high cut things um bass cut rather and um you, you get a definitely a very high high pitched kind of thing going on with the echo and this section right here which is called steed uh, this is essentially a pre-delay, and what that means is that, like, it gives it a little bit of a window before the echo kicks in, and really what this is doing is it's giving you the illusion that the, it's more echoey than it really is, because the echo lasts for longer, because it took, it delayed on its own start. I, I know that's probably confusing, but anyway, so what I do for these drums and instrument tracks, rather, it would be way too much to have this whole monster vocal echo on the track. So what I do is I have this setting called 1962 ND, which is basically the same thing, except it does not have the, the steed delay turned on. Usually what I do is I just kind of cut the steed delay here. But um, essentially, that is what it is. The, I get rid of the steed delay, and then I basically just get a little bit of echo that is not delayed at all. And it kind of sounds like an instrument playing in a room, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Usually what I do, because these plugins are very intensive, is I'll do it and then I'll render it to a new track, which is exactly what this blue one here is. So I'm going to remove that, and then you can hear do, 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 what this sounds like. So now you hear it. it sounds like somebody's playing off into the side of the room in a studio and this is what I think is kind of a really cool little trick because it almost gives you the impression that it's real. Listen to the... It sounds flat and dead. Now with the echo. Isn't that crazy? Just a tiny, tiny. It's so subtle. But anyway, so this is a trick that I discovered and I've been using recently that I don't know I don't know if I came up with it or someone else did but I this is what I've been doing to fake it right so it, it's essentially using an echo to emulate the sound of what a room sounds like because most of us don't have Abbey Road Studios at home you know if your room's not treated mine's not it doesn't exactly sound great and so you have to add reverb and this is a great way of adding a little bit of extra reverb I call it like ambiance you know so anyway moving on we've got the drums here too and more or less, uh, you can sort of expect the same thing. Um, this time I didn't mix the individual uh, drums with plugins, but rather I put a plugin over all of them. Here it is. And similar thing as before, you've got this. I did this one with stereo this time because the drums are panned, a little bit of compression, you know the drill, and uh, same thing, tape saturation plugin. Uh, basically, when you're mixing drums, and the reason I did it like this, where I have these two separated, is because from what I know, when Ringo recorded drums, he would do, like, two microphones, you know, one on the main kit, and then, like, uh, the bass drum, right, and one on the overhead. So I try to, rec you know, kind of recreate, recreate that using modern techniques, so that's why we have two drum tracks that are squashed together. We have the kick, and then we have the overhead. So in terms of the overhead, I'll show you what I've got here. Let's solo these. Uh, this is the snare. Snare, I put about 15% to the left channel. Uh, it's not old school in the 60s. As you guys know, they used to mix drums all the way to the left or the right. I don't like doing that. I know it's not retro or whatever, but drums sound better when they're in the middle. I mean, let's just face it. They do. The drum kit is stereo. But it's meant to be that way. So that's how I feel about it. So uh, here's the hats. Again, hats are pretty hard uh, panned to the left. So for the most part, that's what it is. You've got some other things here. The ride symbol will change. It's a really small detail, but you know, for authenticity, drummers will sometimes keep the rhythm going on the hi-hat on the left while they're playing a section so it's nice to have a little bit of both fills out the stereo because you've got the ride 50 percent to the right and then the hats 50 percent to the left so it sounds nice it's also nice being able to switch it up sometimes because then it changes the sound of the song and subconsciously you do hear that oh the rhythm section moved from left to right a little nice trick 
And then uh, pretty much here we've got Toms. Tom High and uh, Tom Low. And then I believe that they're Tom. I don't remember. Let's see. Oh, that's not Tom Low. That is actually mislabeled. That is actually a symbol. So yeah, these two are the Tom tracks right here. These are just fills, which sounds silly by themselves, but if you were to hear it with, you know, the drums and the snare, and that is not with the snare. Hey, now it sounds like a fill, what do you know? And uh, here's, these are the crash symbols, really. Uh, so with toms, I do the same thing, a little bit to the right, and then the floor tom, even more, but not as far, like we don't want to do 50% because that's a little bit too much in my opinion. So I do that at 30, and then I like to put the crash symbol all the way to the left or right, depending on the song. And on this particular one, um, I did it on the right. And basically, it really comes down to like, you listen to your mix afterwards, and you're, sometimes I just go like, all right, which channel could use a little more kick? And if it's the right or the left, sometimes I'll just put the, the symbols over there. So we've got this now, and again, all the uh, effects. So again, you'll notice that it, it, it sounds nice, but it's definitely like an audio, you know, computerized drum track. Um, I do the humanized thing. I try to make the beats a little bit off so they're not perfect, but again, it's not never going to be 100%. Um, so again, we use my little trick. Let's uh, check out this overhead uh, echo that I did, and I imagine this is maybe what you would have heard, you know, like a bleed. That's a better way of putting it. Mic bleed is when you would get a little bit of somebody else's track into your recording. So maybe on the vocal track, you might have heard this from Ringo on the other side of the room, you know? It's very cool. All right, so let's do let's do an A B so you can you can actually hear both of them. So here's the the overhead track plane, and now the overhead. Once again, without. And I'm gonna turn it on at the symbol. You can really hear it. Just it adds a whole level of life to the track. Without it, it just kind of sounds flat honestly um so yeah try that trick out if you don't have access to abbey road like me give yourself a fake studio and uh you know mix in some mic bleed uh so yeah all together we've covered the drums so far that's a folder track i'm gonna squash it all together so this is what we have for our drum track so far And uh, by the way, guys, I'm going to post all the isolated tracks on my Patreon. I just, I can't, like, do the whole video here and listen to every single one of these all the way through. It would take forever. So, anyway, let's move on to the next instrument. Let's talk about the bass. And on the bass, um, I, I used my new Hofter on this. Man, that thing sounds so freaking good. Um, really don't need to put too much on it. But let's see here. Uh, okay, this is EQ. Um, all this is is a well here. Let me let me do this first. I'm gonna remove all the effects. So you can just hear what the bass sounds like with nothing like going in. You can tell I'm an expert, right? It took me years to learn. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> not not the most interesting uh, not the most interesting bass line at least but all right so you get it that's the tone it doesn't sound bad at all right uh so this first thing is the eq and all this does is to roll off around 100 uh really all this is is that the grumble uh that you can sometimes get from it doesn't sound pleasant and there's really nothing down there that's going to help the song it's just going to make it sound muddy so a lot of a lot of uh, studio guys will just say start you start out by just rolling off the bass around 100 somebody told me that years ago and i've been doing it ever since so i'm not going to change now but that, that's why okay let's move on uh i think i was playing that through god i'm not sure that might have been mike you know, that was actually direct in. Sometimes I mic the amp. On this particular one, I didn't. I did it direct in for the bass. And so I've got this amp plugin now that I've been messing around with. This setting that I have combined is a uh, Fender Basement amp with a Neumann uh, U87. I think it sounds pretty similar to, I don't know, what 
Paul would have gotten in the studio, so I'll let you hear. It actually makes a big difference. It's quite nice. So let's put it on. You know, I'm going to skip to a different section just so you can... Okay, so here's the amp. Right? Now it sounds like an amp. It's got a reverb on it. Uh, moving on, we've got the red console again. Really not too much. I really just boosted the low tone just a tiny bit. Um, you can hear, I don't think it really makes too much of a difference. Very subtle. So what I did, really that, it does decrease the volume quite a bit. I do not want the view meter to go too far into the red. Um, I try to keep it somewhat decent. Um, it's a good tip by the way if any of my early tracks i there a lot of them are like way too loud that's what happens when you don't mix with meters and when you use headphones and uh just in general if you just like are trying to mix everything to final volume something i should have learned back then is that nothing you mix here is going to be loud enough so just remember that um, at the very end you're going to do a mastering plugin that will bring it up to listening volume but don't attempt to get these things up to volume because then you're going to end up with a bunch of distortion. So pro tip, not really. It's actually kind of a newbie tip that I should have learned before. But now you know. Uh, so here's the compressor. Again, I usually do this Abbey Road one or sometimes I use like a Fairchild plugin type thing. But uh, the compressor is nice too. Again, just adds a little more oomph to the bass. I'll let you hear it. and the tape saturation not much and again we use my little uh fake room ambiance trick and you can hear what that sounds like by itself and i should also mention so far i've had all these echoes in the center so far that doesn't mean that's the case with all of them but with this particular one because i'm mixing the bass in the center i want to keep it in the center so all right and let's compare dry almost a tiny subtle doubling that you would really never hear unless it was isolated And you can see, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, the volumes on these are pretty low. You know, I've got my bass here at negative six, and 10 dB lower is the echo. And that's even kind of a lot. I mean, the, on the drums, I think negative 12, negative 13. So, yeah, pretty pretty low. Not a lot going on. Um, let's, uh, let's solo these tracks. And, uh, yeah, you can hear what we've got so far with the bass. And really, this is all in the center except for... The overhead where we've got a stereo mix going left and right all right cool so that is pretty much the first thing I do I tend to mix the bass and the drums first and uh really i like to get that mix going good because that's the the backbone of the whole song so once you've got bass and drums then you can move on to the next thing and uh for this i actually did the organ first um mostly because it's just such an organ heavy song and i thought it would be easiest to do that first so this is me on my kawaii which i ran in through a midi cable and i used uh, my dog really to record it via MIDI and then the virtual instrument I used was actually it's actually free believe it or not I'll post a link to it in the description but it's it's completely cost nothing and it sounds like a Vox Continental it's really close so uh yeah that's what I use for this um basically here's what this is I'll, sh I'll show you what each of these are this is the main organ track that you all know and love that you typically hear when you listen to the song
And on this, I've got some effects. This is a guitar amp. Again, this is a uh, Vox AC30 this time and a condenser. I usually do guitar amps for organ stuff because back in the day, that's what bands would have done in the studio. They would have honestly put the output right into a guitar amplifier and it changes the character massively. Let me show you. Here's without it. Sounds kind of like a cheap Casio keyboard, right? And then with the amp. Oh! It's like a totally different... So yeah, definitely do that. If you're going to play organ, don't just run it in. Run it out through guitar amp after, and then you'll be really glad that you did. Again, Red 37. A little bit of compression on here. Let's see. Just a little punch. And that. So, I'm going to show you what these other tracks are now, too. All the organs are going to be mixed the same way. Um, right here in the center, what I had originally done is that this main track had this bottom thing on it right here, this track. But this track is mixed more towards the center, and it's easier to hear for the listener. So, I ended up flipping them, and I'll show you why. This is what's going on here. So, this thing right here is what you typically don't hear, and this is the, the melody the main melody hook of the organ, but it's being doubled on a low octave. Check this out. And then together, it sounds quite nice because this section has the G droning, and then this one has the whole riff being doubled. And so this track right here is dead center because there's no vocals yet it's the intro and i really want you know that to be prominent um i thought it sounded good like this so what happened here if i'm remembering correctly is that the solo was panned all the way to the right with my main organ track let's check it out let's make sure yeah there you go and so I had found originally when I had done the mix that with my double, here's the double. So there's the double. What had happened was I felt like the double was more prominent in the mix than the main part. You see. can't hear the I especially like that little ending riff the and I felt like it was it was basically being overshadowed so w to kind of get around that what I have here is a doubled version of that track but this one is panned 15% left and that should help balance out the strong right track and when we got the double, the bass double right in the middle, it actually all sounds quite balanced when it's all together. Nice. And so now your ears aren't fighting and neither side feels like it's too strong when we've got the main hook that we want right in the middle. Um, this, ooh, this is supposed to be an accent, not the main fill. So you get it. Anyway, uh, same thing, just for fun, because it's, it's fun to listen to. Organ, uh, just the echo by itself. It's pretty cool, right? It almost sounds like you're standing outside in the control booth listening in. It's, I don't know, it's trippy. So, uh, yeah, let's hear that with, let's hear the whole organ, and then I'll, uh, it, I'll unmute the echo so you can hear it. So yeah, quite a difference, subtle, it's always nice, and that's why I put this on basically every track, pretty much. So, all right, let us move on to the next instrument. I'm actually going to take a break here and make sure that this whole thing is recording and I'm not wasting my time, and I will be back in a second. 
All right, and we're back. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about are the guitars. Basically, on this particular track, both of them are going to be pretty much rhythm guitars. Um, generally, with guitars, you just sort of want to play each rhythm part differently if it is something like this. So on the first guitar, uh, yeah, let's just listen to that. And again, uh, let's do the effects actually first. Similar stuff here. I believe this one, I'm, I don't remember again if I recorded this mic through an amp. And then added an amp to it after. Probably not because uh, usually I don't add an amp if I'm already using an amp. But uh, yeah, you can hear it without it first. It'll... Very dry. And uh, usually I think that it's going to be the amp and the compressor that makes the biggest difference here. L let me turn the. Well, here, let's do this first. Here's with the amp. Yeah, the compressor is nice. It gives that bite to it. Yeah, you can really hear in the beginning of the song, you can almost hear the pick going against the strings in DC5's version. And I really like that. That's what the compressor gives. So, uh, and again, tape saturation. Oh, we've also got the uh, echo section. And of course, together, I'll add it on. Nice. So yeah, for the guitar, um, I don't know. I like to put guitars and stuff like that really kind of far, um, 60 to 70%. This one's 75% to the right. And then the echo itself is 60%. I feel like the echo would be a little closer to the center. Um, I don't know, just because most of the mics, the bass, the drums, those are all in the center. So if it were going to bleed and we were going to mix that track for real, it would, wouldn't be all the way to the same side as the instrument. But whatever. I just do that because it's too unbalanced for me if it's all the way to one side. Same thing here with the guitar. Honestly, I think the effects are identical. Yeah, they pretty much are. Uh, Vox AC30 with a condenser. So uh, here we go. Let's listen to it. And then without the effects, ooh, ooh, let's do that. So this is great, by the way. I'm I'm actually a big fan of this now. That you know, it, I used to like wake up my neighbors and stuff like that. Uh, but nowadays, you can actually get some really convincing amp sounds. Almost like you can't tell the difference because I can A/B this with my actual Vox, and it it's honestly even for me, I I don't think I can tell the difference. All right, echo. And together. Just a little bit of slap back there. And uh, so yeah, this one is gonna be mixed mostly to the left. And uh, same thing with the echo, not as far. And then you'll hear that when you do that, they sort of sound balanced um, when there's equal on both sides. And essentially, you'll notice the same thing throughout most of the song where you, you want to do variation a little bit, you know, so that every chord is not the same on both guitars. love that chord right there uh yeah so those are the guitars and so i suppose what we should do at this point is let's listen to the track so far here what i'll do is i'll turn off the guitars because we sort of rushed into that and uh here so this is just with organ organ drums and bass <laughs> a 
is not bad. Uh, it's honestly, I mean, it definitely sounds empty. Okay, let's see here. So, uh, adding the guitars in. Let's see. Let's do that. Boom, boom, boom. All right. <laughs> Right, cool uh so yeah next we have tambourine and uh usually with tambourine nowadays i don't like doing well actually i've never done it with tambourine but with this kind of stuff i don't like doing synth um for whatever reason it, tambourine just sounds better when it's actually being played i think probably the reason why is just because uh, for whatever reason we're not always perfect with tambourine and that and you also hear the jangle when you pull away from the tambourine, and I noticed with a lot of synth programs, it's just the hit. It's pa, pa, and you're not getting the, well, the natural movement of the person in the room. So, yeah, so here's the tambourine track. Let's hear that. You hear the fadeaway I'm talking about, though? That's how you know it's a real tambourine. And, uh, same thing with the echo. There you go. All right, and uh, pretty much that is it with the instruments so far. So the tambourine, I put 40% to the left. And again, similar things to how you would do the crash cymbals. You kind of judge, you know, what is where already and where you're going to have room. I could Sometimes I put the tambourine to the right. It doesn't really matter. For this particular song, I liked it on the left. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. Oh, and as far as effects, let me see. Yeah, again, same old, same old, uh, just the, uh, yeah, pretty much looks like just the old plugins that I've been using, old, well, new, old plugins. All right, let's see here. Okay, the vocals. All right, this one is going to take the most explanation, and I'll go into it. So first and foremost, all these vocals are already bounced, as you can see right here. Uh, the reason why they're bounced is because generally with a double vocal like this, you're going to have to process each one individually, and it just takes a long time. For me, it's simpler to just sing both vocal tracks, you know, get the two takes that I like the best, and then render that as one raw file, which is what I get here. And then afterwards, I can go through and apply my effects to both vocals individually. So... That's just how I do it. Um, it's different for everyone, though. So, let's see here. Okay. Here, I don't think I have that much. Um, and you know what? The reason why I don't think I have that much is probably because when I did the export before, I put the effects that you've been seeing. You know, the red tracking, um, a little bit of compression, but really nothing different than what we've already done so far. And then I rendered that. It can get very costly to do a ton of plugins, especially if you have four vocal tracks or more. And so it, that's what I often do is that I'll I'll add the effects or you know minimal processing, and then I'll export them, and then I'll have it ready for my final edition. So looks like that's what I did here. Without the effects on it, you would basically just probably hear already not that bad of a track anyway. It's right that I should care about you and try to make you happy when you're blue. So really, that's essentially the dry track without uh, without anything but just some mild compression and then the tape saturation. Uh, what I've got here is a little bit of EQ, and you can hear what that does. Let's turn this back on. It's right that I should care about you And try to make you happy when you're blue So it's weird. A lot of times just letting you know we're influenced by loudness. Go look up the loudness war. The other one might sound better to you at first listen because it actually is louder. But what this one actually is doing is that it is changing a little bit of the EQ here. So I'm, I'm boosting some lows and mids. And uh, really, it's just I think a lot of it also is um, to 
control some of the problem frequencies. So that's what I do. I like this particular Schlepp's, uh, whatever it is, the vocal preset. Um, for this song, anyway, I thought it sounded good. So that, we've got that so far. And what I'm going to do, actually, next, and I'll show you this one, too. Because the... Let's do this. All right. Here is the weird low harmony that nobody hears. It's right that I should care about you And try to make you happy when you're blue It's right it All right, so here's what the echo chamber is, all right? Normally... I would probably have done this the same way I did with these blue tracks, but I think with these ones, I wanted to be able to control it. So, uh, check this out. The echo chamber. Right now, I've got this at barely 10%. Let me show you what this sounds like at 100%. And this is with the, for me to you, double delay with the really high frequency, um, it, I mean, it sounds very Beatles-ish. You, here, you tell me. This is just the high one. It's right. That didn't work. Oh, I did it on the wrong track. Here you go, guys. It's right that I should care about you And try to make you happy when you're blue it's pretty crazy, right? I mean, it very much sounds... It's got that old Abbey Road vibe. Let's see. I love you. Long echo. Love it. So that's what we do, but obviously that is way too much, and I can't, you know, do that to 100% because it's insane. So really w what you can do is you, have, you essentially have two options. You can really... Uh, you could put this at 100% and then export that track and then you'll have a full wet track and then you can put that on a different track over here and raise and lower the volume of that to your heart's content to mix it. Or you can do it this way in, in the unit. Um, the benefit to doing it the other way is that you're not using up all the CPU if your computer is struggling because uh, then you've already rendered the file and now the plugin's baked in. But if you want to do it this way, you can actually control the dryer wet inside. So. You'll hear, let's do the, uh, let's, let's hear how much it actually adds. Let's do that. It's right that I should care about you and try to make you happy. So you can hear even at 10%, it's very echoey. And you can imagine the more you do it with two voices, it's crazy. Um, this whole echo chamber thing is really cool for me. I don't even know uh, if this is something that I'm just like going off topic with, but from what I've read about this, before we had like electronic reverb and stuff, what bands like the Beatles would do is that they would sing the vocal, right, in Abbey Road, and then their vocal track would get exported out into this tiny room that has these concrete poles in it, right? And there's a speaker in this room, and it would blast John or Paul's vocal against the wall and make it echo everywhere and then a microphone in this room would pick up that wet echo signal and then the engineers would mix them dry and wet and then they'd have a final track and that's how they did it before they had effects i mean it's funny because abbey road actually had reverb plates too at one point and for whatever reason the beatles always liked using the old echo chamber so it sounds great uh these effects again that i think clay blair had come up with um i'll put a link to his video and channel in the description uh they sound great and i think it's spot on in terms of what abbey roads chamber sounded like back in 62 63 uh and i love the sound so enough of that let's listen to what these both sound like drenched in beautiful echo chamber echo it's right that i should care about you and try to make you happy when you're blue. It's right, it's right to feel the way I do. Because, because I love you. There it 
is. So, as I said before, vocals, I always feel like, should go right in the middle. Gives us a nice balanced mix everywhere. Uh, yeah, and the last thing that I mentioned earlier in the video was that you do not want to try to make this as loud uh, as it's going to finally be when you listen to it. This video is deceiving because unless you've been watching really closely, you might not notice that I actually do have a plugin already on the master. So you're hearing this louder than what it would actually sound like. If I turn this off, listen to how soft it is. just an example and really you shouldn't do too much to your master that is going to people always ask like oh, how do I change this because you know now you should be doing that in the mix first and then the master should just be kind of like a final polish again in my opinion uh, so with the master I've got a couple new things that I'm trying originally and I've done a couple tracks like this I would mess around with maybe some compressor uh, compressor units um, again more tape saturation I didn't really like the results that I, I was getting. Um, I usually like to do some sort of limiter. Um, this was on sale for whatever reason. I don't know. It was some special. And I got Ozone 9 from Isotope. Uh, I actually like this a lot. Um, if you're not super keen on learning all these settings, you can do this thing called the Master Assistant that basically like listens to a section of your song and will pretty much just give you a good baseline of where to start you can even export it just like that and it'll probably sound good um but that's essentially what i've done here for the most part there's really not too much going on a little bit of eq to control the high end and stuff and yeah i mean i don't really go i don't want to go into too much detail with all this but there you know a little bit of a limiter um although i think i turned that off well no i didn't uh, and then the, no, the compressor is off. That's what it is. Because, again, I already did my compression before. And then I think the maximizer mostly just is going to help you with sort of bringing it up to listening volume, um, which, again, depends on where you're going to do it. Streaming, MP3, CD, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, that is pretty much it. That's the video. Um, the final track gets all exported and... Uh, yeah, usually with your fading, make sure to put a nice little at the end. Um, you can see right here, just throwing this out there. Don't be afraid to boost volumes. You know, if they were in the studio, some guy behind the desk could go up and throw his finger up on the slider for a chord. Trust me, I used to do it all the time when I used to mix on the board and not have these things available to me. And you know what? Right here, I thought, man, that 6-9 six, nine, six, nine chord at the end is quite nice. But unfortunately, kind of got drowned out by all the other stuff. So you know what? Make it louder. Who cares? Listen to the end of uh, Roller of Beethoven. That chord's not even real. It's just tacked on. I think that's the one I'm making up. Hey, and one, two, three, four, and I saw her standing there. That's an edit piece. So the first thing you ever hear in any Beatles song on any record ever is an edit. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't mess around with your songs and mess around, change different takes. Look, I probably screwed up on the tambourine right here, and I put an edit from a different part of the song. Who cares? It's all good. It's not going to change the uh, overall quality of your recording. So, I think that's a bit. Uh, yeah, I think that's about all for today. If there's anything else anyone wants to know, if you like these kinds of instructional videos, let me know. Yeah, I hope this helps someone. I'm always trying to learn. I am self-taught, so I do not really know what I'm doing. At least I don't think I do. No, but really, uh, I think I know what I'm doing, but a lot of times I always second guess myself and I'm like, well, you know, I'm just, I've been figuring this out as I go and talking to guys and learning it th over the years. So if anyone has any tips for me, I am all ears. I always want to learn more. Let me know if you see something glaringly obvious that I'm doing wrong, but, uh, at least from what I always say, if it sounds good, it is good. So I think it sounds good and therefore it is good. All right. Have a good one, guys, and uh, thanks for watching. Stay tuned.